Welcome to Event Experience by Visibo, the podcast where we bring the best and brightest event experience leaders together to share stories, tips, and lessons learned from creating some of the world's biggest events. I'm Rachel Moore, your podcast host. Every listener of this podcast can be proud of their own vast event experience. So it's often only a question of what business or brand event profs are building experiences for. In this convo with Mike Frost, founder of ExpoCast, we'll discuss the challenges and opportunities in the recruitment sector of the events industry, particularly in the wake of the pandemic and the air quotes return to normal. Mike is about to share insights on the current state of recruitment, the importance of networking, even for the people who have the most FaceTime opportunities, and strategies for job seekers. We hear about event experience. Now it's time to be able to show off our event experience for that next gig. Let's get started. Today's guest is no stranger to talent. Not only has he been dialed into recruitment in the events industry, but apparently he's a drummer, which is pretty cool. From founding a recruitment agency during the first days of a global pandemic, who doesn't want to do that, that effectively shuttered events worldwide, to sitting across from microphones for me today, he's a trade show tactician and the founder of ExpoCast. I'm pleased to welcome Mike Frost to the podcast. Mike, thanks for joining me on Event Experience. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. Trade show tactician. Let's uh, add that to my profile. So that's brilliant. So yeah, look, thank you so much for having me. I am, as you say, founder of ExpoCast. We work with event companies around the world, finding the right people to join their teams and generally just fighting the good fight for the events industry. It's been a fight. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, let, let me get to some, uh, we're going to segue into some get to know you questions. Let's imagine that if you have to spend a whole day on the ground at an event, what are your go to shoes you're going to be wearing? That's a great question. So I'll be truthful. I went like overly professional to events for my first few years. I was wearing like proper formal shoes and my feet would kill by the end. It's amazing the difference of having your own business can have on how you feel about (laughs) the way that you look. So I went went back to like just classic vans that I wore since I was in a band, right? They just, they always (laughs) fit. They're comfortable. My feet are used to them after like literally 20 years of wearing them. Although the last pair that I bought just blistered me up. I was very annoyed. Very. I was so, so disappointed. Um, So the last couple of shows, I I switched to some Converse. But but yeah, Vans or Converse, which are probably not actually the best really for a shed load of walking. But I'm comfortable in them, so that's okay. Same. So yep. yeah. I'm a Converse gal myself, so so can definitely appreciate that. Is there a particular social post or a piece of media or a hot take about events that you found interesting lately? Good question. So events are such an old format that I, like most sort of like hot takes, as you might put it, they don't really tend to necessarily stand the test of time. Is what I find anyway. I'm enjoying posts that challenge parts of the events experience that are just really painful for attendees in particular making planners really think about why are we doing things the way that we are doing them because everyone's talking about being customer centric these days yet there are still a few certain areas that just don't work um like you know overly long registration forms which they're like oh well you know we're gathering data to make it you know the best as possible don't do it at the reg form or, or, you know, just like really long queues still outside of, of mm. events. You know, the check-in tech is so advanced these days. There's yeah. no excuse. Just get more kiosks for a star, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> get, get people in. The whole point of people going to an event is that they actually get inside the event. So make that yes. happen quicker. Like T- Tamar from Gleaning is her stuff's brilliant. I, I would highly recommend anybody who wants to, yeah, just read somebody calling out the events industry for stuff that they should be doing better by now. Tamar nice. is the one for me. She's awesome. Well, and then what are you listening to, reading, or watching these days that you can't put down? And it doesn't have to be about events. Good, because I don't think any of it is, to be fair. I t- <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, so I'm, I've, I've started watching through Always Sunny in Philadelphia again. It's only my second time going around it. I think it's replaced Brooklyn Nine-Nine as, as my safety show. Like I'm one of those people where like, if I'm going to watch something, but I'm just completely exhausted, I don't want to watch something where I don't know what's going to happen. I like that familiarity, right. Of just being like, this is entertaining. I know what's going to happen. 
I've got two young kids. If I get distracted, that's fine. I can come back and I haven't lost my place. So yeah, Always Sunny is doing it for me at the moment. Reading wise, I don't, I'm not really a fiction guy. So I t- tend to read like business books. There's a guy called Daniel Priestley who's got like four or five books out. They're really, really good, for, for particularly for entrepreneurs. If there's anyone nice. listening who runs their own business, Daniel Priestley is he's just really succinct at how he... You, you'll ask him a question. I was on a Q&A with him yesterday and people just ask him questions and he just blows their mind within like three sentences just because he just <laughs> thinks about things completely differently. And then, yeah, music-wise, obviously being in a band, I would say a heavier like punk band that, that I was in. So that tends to be the genre I lean to. As a, as a band called Stray From The Path, I've just gone into recently. Nice. I'm enjoying a lot, but yeah, it varies a lot. Nice. Well, I trust your judgment on that. I am not the music person. Like, seriously, I'm my my Spotify queue is all like 80s, 90s songs and some mixed in with some show. I mean, you've, and, you've got a guitar in the background there. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I know three. And when I say I know three chords, I, I use the word <laughs> no very liberally. I, I used to just say that was a cosmetic guitar. So I feel like I've moved along a little bit. Hey, well, that's, actually, yeah, that's a step up to progress, right? Take that. Take that every day of the week. Thank you. It seems like just reading your background too. I think you founded ExpoCast in March of 2020. Yes. Wow. <laughs> it was uh, not quite the first 12 to 18 months that we envisaged <laughs> as business uh, business owners. I actually had a co-founder at the time who, who she left the business back in January of this year. We're still very good friends. Don't worry. Yeah. And yeah, we'd worked at the same firm for about three and a half years, decided to set up ourselves. And March 2020 was the time. I think we had roles for about three days, maybe, and then everything just, as you can imagine, disappeared, va- evaporated. Yeah. But it was weirdly good, I think, for us as a business to get the brand out there because we just had an opportunity to take part in all of the industry conversations that were happening. Nobody could run shows. We can re- recruit. And all of the, I guess, industry institutions were trying to do everything that they could to help the the industry recover and survive as best as possible. There were loads of like independent initiatives that took place. And we just tried to get involved with as many of those as possible. So in a bizarre way, it helped with the awareness of this new recruitment brand that was out there, but uh, it didn't help so much on the bank balance side of things for the first (laughs) year or so. Yeah. Yeah. People could probably hear me laughing, but it's only in hindsight. It's like one of those, like we can laugh now, but at the time, ah, which segues nicely into into our first question. So I want to acknowledge the elephant in the room, which may not be much. Everybody's like, yeah, we all know it's there. That is that working in the events industry over what one could generously call a very bumpy last couple of years or last handful of years. First off, uh, I'd love to get your read on, we all see the meme as, you know, how it started, how it's going. Um, You know, how's it going? How are things going for recruitment in the events industry right now? March 2020, very down. Uh, I'm talking to memes, I'm reminded of the the cartoon dog surrounded by fire just saying, everything's fine (laughs) not so great and then 2022 was the real recovery for recruitment within the industry so that was i would say what you'd call a a good year 2023 it leveled off actually really because most companies had managed to back their headcount to what they needed it to be for the level of recovery that they were at and this has actually been Not so great for recruitment, but not specifically for the events industry. The entire recruitment industry is kind of hurting a bit. I'm in various communities and everybody's saying it's the worst that they've ever seen it. So (laughs) it's it's some consolation, I think, to know that it's not just me that hasn't had an absolute banner year. But that doesn't mean to say that getting a job in events or hiring people in events is tricky. There tend to be trends of, of businesses investing in internal talent teams which i think has happened quite a lot over the last couple of years because yeah recruitment consultancies like me can make quite a big dent into a a budget if you've got a lot of vacancies to make over the course of a year so that has had an impact but there are obviously particularly on the tech side of things there have we've seen several rounds of redundancies over the last couple of years as well so i think along the, the tech supplies it's been a bit of a challenging period so how it's going 
mixed, I would say, but generally erring on the side of positivity. I'd, I'd much rather do that. <laughs> well, I, and I think that's part of your role. Uh, speaking as someone who has been in that job seeking, particularly in the last few years, it's rough. Uh, and it can definitely be a time when it's super easy to get feel downtrodden, feel a little bit hopeless. So by nature, as a recruiter, I'm sure you, you've got to, hey, it's going to be fine. I mean, not the everything's fine, ignore the burning room around me, but more like, look, it's going to be okay encouragement, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just that bit that's on fire, that's okay. It doesn't matter if that bit burns. Just put that bit of the fire out and then, you'll, then everything. I think it's, this is it, focusing on the right thing. For those who were for a role for a very long time, one thing that we saw was that you'd have people applying for lots and lots of jobs and either getting no response whatsoever or getting an automated reply which i think should be at the, the bare minimum or even getting through maybe a couple of interview stages for example and just not getting the job and what we saw was if people are just kind of spamming that apply now button it really takes a toll on your mental health because you're just kind of piling up the amount of rejection that you've got to withstand whereas being a bit more focused and intentional about what you apply for is a bit of self-preservation, I would say, really, as, as a job seeker. I think it's really, really crucial to be aware of that aspect of it because I don't think it gets talked about anywhere near enough. Agreed. Yeah. And I appreciate you bringing that up too. I mean, we talk a lot. I mentioned tactician earlier. I mentioned, you know, we, we do talk about tactics and strategy and all those things on here, but we always have to remember, I mean, if there's ever been an industry that is people focused or people based, it is the events industry and all of them really. But yeah, you're talking about people who have to connect and stuff like that, and then also take care of themselves, which we'll get to here in a moment too. I, I want to, let's dive in that. I was going to, I was actually going to go to location, but I think the discussion's taking us in this direction. I'll come back to that. So regardless of whether an event professional is looking for a job or not, one might assume that event profs uh, have no trouble finding work because look, they're in everyone's face all the time. They have exposure to, to people who are decision makers and could, could say, yes, you know, I want to hire you or yes, you know, reach out and we'll interview you. They're immersed in these events where they can network, surely, ad nauseum all the time. Why is that assumption flawed? There's several reasons. I think the first one to acknowledge, actually, is that I think you and I potentially doesn't necessarily seem like it, but a bit of an exception in terms of how involved we are in the wider events industry. A lot of events people, they are siloed within the particular sector that they're running events for or the particular set of clients that they've got or their corporate side and therefore all they know is the events from within that business. I think actually the community of event professionals who have a network within the events industry with probably the minority, I would say. It'd be fascinating to, to see if there's any way of running the numbers. Because even when companies are members of associations, for example, you tend to only have a handful of points of contact within that company who are even aware of that membership. Yes, okay, they might pay for a few tables and awards show every now and then. But other than that, the, the team members within the wider business, they just haven't got a clue, right? And they're not really that immersed in the industry overall. So I think that's a big one. Second one is that if you are at an industry event, your boss is probably there too. So yep. <laughs> you don't, you've got to be a bit careful about how you're seen to be networking with your industry peers. Uh, just, yeah, I think <laughs> it's probably not a bad <laughs> idea to be aware of that. The other thing is, if you're on site at your own event, you're not focused on networking with the intention of, of getting a job somewhere else. You're like, head down, this is the busiest period of the year or quarter or whatever, and you've just got to make sure that event happens. There's a million things that need to go right, and you've got to make sure that is your sole focus. And then the last thing I would say is just because people work in the events industry doesn't actually mean that they're extroverted and networking is a natural like talent for them. I'd actually consider myself an introvert. It took me a long time to learn how to make networking work for me, how I could even start a conversation, keep a conversation going. It was quite unnatural for me. You might find that there's a lot of event professionals in teams or departments who don't necessarily see that customer facing networking side of the industry at all. So there's lots of reasons why 
yeah, it, it isn't the way that you may think it is in terms of ease and ability to find yourself a job just through networking alone. Yeah, I thank you for saying that too. I have a feeling there's so many of our listeners out there are like, yes, we appreciate you acknowledging the fact that you do not have to be someone who's, I'm just going to jump on stage and do a song and dance. And that is my comfort zone. Please don't. Why do yeah. you think I was a drummer? I got to sit at the back. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, got, I got to live out my pretend rock star dreams, but sitting at the back of the stage, I just let my, my mate sing and do it, take all the, uh, the attention. Yeah. I just got to hit things with sticks. It was great fun. Right. Exactly. I think you've, that's a great analogy too. Yeah. Cause it's so easy to fall into these stereotypes of like, well, and also one thing, it just made me think of it too. So even if you are at a, a trade show or a conference and you're working the event, you're doing your thing. It's very unlikely that someone who had that has a potential saying, yes, I'm hiring for my team. Their headspace isn't there. They're thinking about their own team's presence and the ROI they need to bring back from that event. They're not going to be like, ooh, I see that person is doing an exceptional job. I should make sure I reach out to let, them. Let me make a mental note of that. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, look, it, it can happen, I think, in that way, but it would tend to be across multiple events. And if you yeah. consistently as somebody who may be hiring in the future, if you consistently see the same person or people over and over again being just generally impressive, that's going to sit with you over time. But it's not going to be a case of, oh, I stumped, bumped into so-and-so at this event and actually they were really good. So actually next time we have a need for this type of job, they're the person I want to hire. It just doesn't work that quickly. You need, it's marketing, I guess, isn't it? And sales, you need that multiple number of touch points for that sense of familiarity and likability to get across to the extent where you'd think of someone's name next time you're hiring. It just doesn't happen on a one-off occasion. That's right. Well, this segues beautifully into, I think, something you can probably really help a ton of our listeners with, and that's networking. Recalling that our listeners are those same event profs that everyone assumes must be just fantastic at networking. No, maybe not. It's not just this like inherent, oh, if you're an event professional, obviously you're great at networking. Maybe not and probably not. So please uh, enlighten us, uh, educate us. What is your advice on how an event professional can effectively network? Yes. So as I said, I'm uh, not a natural networker myself. So it's a ease yourself in. Don't just think, right, I don't know what I'm doing, but next time I go to an event, I'm going to be the best networker in the room. Don't rely on serendipity. It's not going to just happen. Some of the best conversations do happen completely by chance, but being much more intentional, you're increasing the chances of one of those conversations you have, have turning into an organic series of relationships that might then result in some mm -hmm. kind of career advancement, including people that you already know with your plans to network. If there's perhaps somebody whose company you would love to work for and you have a friend in the industry who knows them already, just say, hey, look, if this person's at the next show that we're at, could you just introduce me? No strings attached. I just want to make my face and name known to them. And that's yeah. it. Just keep it really zero pressure, right? On yourself as well as the other person who you're asking to make the introduction. Just don't have any expectations about what's going to happen because that we're human beings, right? Events is a people industry. Recruitment is a people industry. It's never a straight line. <laughs> so just don't expect that any one conversation is something you can predict the outcome of. And then I would also just say, don't only talk shop. Yes, we're events people. We love the industry. We want to talk about it. But if you're going to develop that likability and that familiarity and that memorability within the other person, try and weave something a bit more personal into the conversation. Like, what, you were a drummer for 10 years? Me too. That's like one of my um, friends who I see at every single event, industry event, he's Similarly got a ginger beard, much more impressive than mine. He was in a band. He was the singer. We were on the exact same scene at the exact same time. It's a miracle that we never played at the same gig. Like, we've both got sons called Ruben, named after a band called Ruben, who are on the same music scene as us. Wicked band, by the way. You should definitely check them out. So he and I have a much, much stronger relationship because we found something in common. And it doesn't have to be that 
crazy coincidence right. or but when you're networking especially if you've got like career in the back of your head don't just think to yourself right i need to keep proving my value as an events professional to this person i've got to make sure i come across really professional so that they think of me just have as organic a conversation as you have allow it to move into personal stuff as long as you feel comfortable doing that because then you'll find those things you've got in common and again that just makes you that much more memorable I love that advice too, because you're right. You can come off very salesy and all of us love when people approach us with that sales tactic kind of, yes, obviously I, the radar is instantly up. What do you want from me? But instead, and I think about, I went to Advent Tech Live earlier this year and just being in line for getting a snack and everybody can like, yeah, hungry, right? I mean, there's those common denominators, weather, food, current events. Sometimes you can kind of be careful, like which ones you bring up. But I mean, any of those things or even just, oh God, it's cold in here. It's hot in here, whatever. But it's surprising like how easy it is sometimes just test the waters right there. And then the person either picks it up or they're like, nah, I'm not going there. And then you're like, great, move on to the next one. And it's This is it. I, I'm, I'm British. I think basically most conversations in, in Britain kick off with the weather. Uh, <laughs> like we're never happy. It's, like, it's either too cold and wet and windy or the, the one day of hot weather that we've been crying out for for 12 months hits and then all of a sudden that's too hot. A little bit cooler. We find a healthy balance, which never happens. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Some sort of just throwaway icebreaker, right, that allows them to engage if they want to, basically. And yeah, don't take it to heart if that doesn't happen. You've still had that like first touch point with that person and there'll be another event in the future or you know, another line for coffee where you can bump into them again, right? That's right. Well, that all kind of brings up like one, one great thing. Everybody always likes talking about where they're from and like what they love about it. Oh, their travel to get there or travel that they're facing to get home, which, which actually brings up, I'm assuming probably figures into this. Speaking of things that have gone very topsy turvy in the space of just a few short years, you know, we've gone from in person to completely virtual by necessity and then by choice. And then we're back to hybrid or in person and, and often virtual. Can you speak to how location impacts the career of an event professional today? Yeah, sure. And obviously, we're, we're talking about um, work environments here in terms of going completely virtual and then and hybrid and back to the office. So it depends massively on the nature of the role and the company. So on the tech side, I don't think fully remote was particularly uncommon before the pandemic anyway. Whereas on the organizer side, everybody was just in the office all the time. You might have had the occasional small business who were able to offer a bit more hybrid. So yeah, the vast majority of organizers now are hybrid. There's like one or two trying to cling to the full day, for, yeah, full five weeks, five days a week in the office. I just saw something other, earlier today that Amazon have gone five, kicking in January 2025. So they've given people, what, like three and a half months to essentially make sure they are in a commutable distance five days. I think that's crazy. But I think there are going to be a lot of companies who off the back of that go, well, hey, if Amazon are doing it, we'll do it too. My answer to this question may change in like two and a half, three months time, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Dab you back on and talk about yeah. like how, what, yeah, what's go. going on I'm now. Just, li <laughs> just lining up my next guest spot. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, look, you know, doing hybrid is vastly different from doing full-time in the office. You can swallow a slightly longer commute if you're only doing it two or three days yeah. a week than compared to doing a five. I would say in terms of on the, the organizer, the event planner side, it's the small businesses who are perhaps not located near those main hubs right. who have ventured more into remote. You know, we've got a client in Canada, who have hired people remotely in the UK and the Middle East to work for them. We've had a, an inquiry from a company based in like, I think they were Worcester here in the UK, which is yeah. not really near enough to any main cities where you might find a large enough candidate pool with events experience. So they were like, that's fine. Just need someone with the right experience. It doesn't matter where they are in the UK. We'll make it work. And they were a very small business. 
So they, I guess you'd call it a lifestyle business as well. So they couldn't necessarily afford to completely relocate where they were to somewhere that would attract more talent. They just needed to make sure that their infrastructure was set up to be able to have people work uh, on a remote basis. So location does impact your career. I don't think we've seen the end of it fluctuating. Mm -hmm. uh, like today's Amazon news, yeah. We'll see how it works. You know, there, there has been some reduction in terms of flexibility from some of the companies offering hybrid. You know, yeah. you did have what I would call flexible working as opposed to hybrid. Hybrid is probably, to me, set days of the week that you come in, you right. know, set start and end times. Whereas flexible is you have to be in like a set number of days per week, but you choose what they are. And right. you've got like, you can flex your start time and end times, which is super useful for things like childcare and appointments and all sorts of things. We have seen a few companies reduce it coming down from flexible down to hybrid, which technically is the same number of days in the office, but there's way less flexibility. We'll be right back with more event experience after the break. Hey, event professionals, do you want to hear more from the industry's top event experience leaders? Don't miss out on future episodes of the Event Experience Podcast by Bizabo. Hit subscribe, drop us a review, and share this episode with your friends and colleagues. The Event Experience Podcast by Bizabo, where events come to life. We're back with Mike Frost to succeed with Event Profs CVs. You know, we're talking a lot about things that event profs can't control. They can't control if a company is going to be in person, hybrid, what have you. Some of the things they can control, and we're getting into CVs and interviews. Would love to kind of hear what is your advice? What's your advice for our listeners as far as like, and again, in, in an environment where it is a little bit hard even just to get that first interview and stuff, what's your advice for you? prepping your CV and making sure this one's going to stand out regardless of how many applicants and also what ATS or applicant tracking system is happens to be <laughs> bringing in that CV. What's your advice? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, and I try and give this advice to everybody that I speak to you know, when I'm screening candidates and I've got either if I've got their CV already, I'm giving them feedback or if they haven't updated it yet and they're going to send it to me, I'm kind of giving them these tips before they send it to me to make mm -hmm. sure it's kind of going to have the best shot possible. And I do think this isn't supposed to be self-promotion, but I do think having a recruiter to mm -hmm. advocate for you is a massive advantage over applying directly just through an online advert, but that's not your question. So for CVs, keep it factual. It massively varies on the reader and you don't know who's going to be reading it. You haven't got a clue. So I would just make sure it is genuine to you and your experience. So when I say factual, that is going to vary depending on the type of event professional you are and what department you're in. So it could just be the names of the events, the sizes of the budgets. It could be, if you're a salesperson, what you delivered in sales versus your target. It has to be contextual. Number of visitors, what venues you've worked out of, which softwares and CRMs you've used. Because like you say, their CV, it might be the 100th CV read by that person that day. Yeah. So another thing to do is make sure that all of that factual stuff just really jumps off the page. Try not to have, I guess, any vague stuff on that first page because you can't guarantee they're even going to scroll down. If you've got half a page of just personal profile and skills like in a, in a table and bullet points, they're like, they're already sighing by the time they're <laughs> using their finger to scroll down the finger that is exhausted from scrolling down 99 other CVs. So get straight to the good stuff. Just highlight in bold those numbers so that they just jump off the page. It's really simple, but it works. Those are my favorite CVs to come across are the ones where nice. I'm just scrolling down the page and in bold, there's numbers and percentages and the names of shows and companies. That nice. I, like, I just recognize all of those things straight away. And immediately my interest is peaked. This person is highlighting all of the information that I'm looking for. I don't, I'm not having to work to try and find it. They have done that work for me by making it really, really visible. So that would be the number one advice for CVs. For interviews, I think for me, research 
which is way more than just reading a job description. You're well within your rights to ask for the questions in advance, which is especially helpful for neurodivergent people who will benefit from just having as much context as possible going into something. Because not everybody is naturally equipped, I think, to be able to answer stuff on the spot. I think not everyone necessarily is aware of that as a reasonable adjustments for interviews. So you might find that some companies may push back and say, no, we're not going to give you the questions in advance. Some companies might not have the answers. They might just be winging it. Like This is another thing with interviews. Don't just because somebody is interviewing you doesn't mean they know how to interview. They might just be a hiring manager who's got, okay, there's a space on my team. I'll go and interview someone and, you know, ask them questions the way I think I should. And they've yep. never really had any training. So yeah, keep bear in mind, <laughs> your, your interviewer doesn't necessarily have any expertise coming into this conversation. But yeah, absolutely. You can ask questions in advance. Try and, and one of those questions as well to ask is, who am I being interviewed by? And then, like, don't stalk anyone, but do look at their LinkedIn profiles. Again, like we were talking about with the networking, it's trying to find things you've got in common because it will just help you to stand out from anybody else that they're interviewing. So if you've got things in common, like you can, again, don't stalk anybody, but you can go on this if you can find them on, like, the more social social media profiles rather than LinkedIn, you know, your Instagrams or Facebooks or whatever. If they've got anything that resonates with you, bring up your experience and your like of that thing in the interview. And then hopefully they'll chime in and say, oh, hey, me too. Brilliant. Yeah. And yeah, it's okay. It's a plant. I wouldn't say it's deceptive, but it's a plant, right? It will just paint you in that slightly brighter light throughout that interview process. And I do shameful plug but it's it's free right i have a free mini course that runs through all of this stuff so the cv nice. stuff the interview stuff the networking standing out there's a whole chunk on linkedin as well that is available on the website but i have a feeling you might give me a chance to properly plug that at the end i absolutely <laughs> will well and just like you just said you use what you can to your advantage right whether it, it is a free course uh hell, heck yeah i'm gonna take a free course or you know, like you said, finding you know, where, whatever public information, like if you know who's interviewing you, go and just like check them out, see if you can find them. And if you just find that commonality, and like you said, it's just peppering yourself in there, which is good marketing. Like you mentioned that before, you're marketing yourself, even though that might not feel like it, it absolutely is. And all you're trying to do is make sure you're standing out amongst the rest of the fray. Like you said, if that is, if you're that hundredth CV that they've read that day, and you're able to then get an interview. And then again, still kind of stand out and they remember you because fill in the blank that can be make the difference. Yeah. And I would say actually, in terms of looking up your interviewers, it's not just about trying to find something in common and understanding more about them. The reason you feel nervous going into an interview is because You don't really know what to expect. Yes, you've got an investment in the outcome of this conversation, but Mm -hmm. just seeing that person's face on a profile picture on LinkedIn, that removes a certain level of, I don't know what to expect because you know what the face of the person you're walking into the room looks like. The more unknowns you can remove by doing your research ahead of an interview, the more your nerves will be calmed going in and, and then you can just concentrate on the important stuff essentially yeah. you know don't just type in if it's an in-person interview don't just type in the addresses on google maps say okay it's going to take me 45 minutes to get there i'll give myself an hour and a quarter and head off like yeah do the google street view know what the front of the building looks like mm. you know it's simple things like that that just it's familiarity you know because if i didn't do that i'd be sat on the train i'd just be thinking right okay well i know this is the next bit of my journey. But then I'm just following the blue line on Google Maps and walking to the office. I don't know what the building looks like. What if I can't recognize the building? Just looking these things up helps make sure that your nerves are focused on the bit that it should be focused on, which is presenting yourself in the best possible way during the interview. 
as someone who once uh, many, many, many years ago, so maybe it, hopefully the map's better. I used Google Maps and the Google Maps took me to the shipping docks of the building and, and I was five minutes late for my interview. Oh, I think no. I still got the job amazingly. Even, my phone even went off during the interview, which was hilarious. And I was like, there's no way. And then I got, uh, okay. You know, hey, sometimes the stars can align. Final question, easiest question. Where can our listeners find and follow you online? I mean, LinkedIn is pretty much the only online place I hang out. Every now and then, like six months or so, I'll try Instagram again, and it just doesn't stick. You have like yeah. a week of posts from me, <laughs> and then I disappear again for another six months. So yeah, LinkedIn <laughs> LinkedIn is the social <laughs> place. And then obviously, yeah, the website is expocast.co.uk. Email is mike at expocast.co.uk. And everything's on there, really. The free course. I mean, nice. you talked about for companies and, and hiring managers, I do have a free assessment on there of their Ooh. talent attraction. It's like a mini audit and it's just, just answer a bunch of questions and it will give them a score and tell them how good or bad they are and what that's they great. can do to improve. So yeah, that's quite, that's quite a funky thing to have on there too. Well, we love the funky, let's do it. All right, well, thank you so much. To fill up your career journey, Mike expands on the power of mentors. One major piece of advice, finding a mentor is a huge, and I talk about this a bit in the course, it's a huge advantage because, you know, ideally you would find somebody who is one or two steps ahead of you on the exact career path that you would like to take. Or even if you don't know what career path you want to take, someone who was doing your job a job or two ago. Yeah. Because then their experience in what you're going through now is recent enough that it's going to be accurate because stuff changes, right? You know, if you're a marketing person and you get your mentor who was doing your job 20 years ago, they look very, very different. So those types of relationships, you can learn so much from somebody's lived experience in that yeah. job. And it might not just be what they did right, you're learning from what they got wrong as well. Sometimes those are the better lessons, really, the things that people got wrong. There are some formalized, like events, mentorship programs out there, but I think most tend to just happen organically, whether it is you know, one of these conversations that we've talked about at events where you just end up getting on with somebody and it almost, you, it's not like you ever have to necessarily really have that conversation of, please, would you be my mentor? Um, <laughs> it's just, yeah, it just happens. You just, you know, I've got, I've got a guy I chat to every couple of weeks on Zoom. He's been, you know, very senior in the events industry on the organizer side. And we just chat every two weeks. And nice. sometimes it's me helping him on the, the career side of things. Sometimes it's him helping me with, you know, trying to be a, a business owner <laughs> having launched in a pandemic. It's a two way street, right? You know, even if you would consider yourself the mentee and the other person is the mentor, that doesn't mean they can't learn from you as well. Right. You know, it's very much a two way street. So if you're asking me for one major piece of advice, I would say that, yeah, try and find someone who has been where you are and can help you make the right decisions. Thanks again to Mike Frost for joining us on Event Experience, and thank you for listening. If you're enjoying the show, we'd love to hear it. Connect with us on social and subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you're listening. Also, don't forget to share the show with your colleagues and friends. You can find transcripts of each episode and key takeaways on visibo.com forward slash podcast. On behalf of the team, thank you. We'll gather again soon for a new episode of Event Experience. Event Experience.